Hi, Internet. A while back, I showed you how to make your own lathe out of junk, and we've used it several times on the show. Now, in this episode, we're going to start looking at ways to improve the lathe and upgrade pieces. Now, a problem we have is that a lot of the parts are made out of wood, and they work fine for a simple lathe, but they're not really suitable for a precision lathe. So the next step is going to be to start replacing wooden pieces with metal pieces. But to do that, we need a better way to melt metal than my little camp stove. What we actually need is a foundry with a real blast furnace. Probably not quite as complicated as that. But every foundry has the same basic components. You need a furnace that burns fuel to make heat, an air blast to add oxygen and make the fire hot, crucibles to hold the molten metal, and some kind of mold to pour the metal into. Today we're going to focus mainly on the furnace, and I'll show you how to build the rest of it in other episodes. The type of furnace we're building was first popularized by Dave Gendry in the 1980s and has been used by thousands of small-scale metal workers ever since. It consists of a metal bucket or pail of at least 5 gallons, which is lined with refractory grout. This type of furnace can use either a gas burner or a charcoal with an air blast, and it's a good solution for melting pot metal or aluminum to make small or medium-sized castings. First, you'll need the bucket. I used a 7 gallon metal trash bin from the hardware store. You also need some paper tubes to make forms. I found some oatmeal cans and a piece of mailing tube that were about the right size. I'm using a fairly large tube for my air blast because I haven't decided whether to power it with gas or charcoal yet, so I'm leaving plenty of extra space knowing I can fill it in with more grout later. The first thing you need to do with your bucket is to make a hole in the bottom. This will serve as a drain if the crucible breaks or spills, and that way the metal will run out the bottom instead of clogging up your furnace. Now mark with a felt pin where you want the air blast tube to come in. You can start this hole with a hole saw or a drill, but you'll need to finish it with snips. Unless, of course, you're lucky enough to have an air-powered nibbler. To lay out the joint where the forum tubes come together, I turned the bucket upside down and temporarily taped one of the oatmeal cans for reference. You want the air blast to come in at a slight angle so it will swirl around the crucible. You need to cope the end of the tube so it fits against the main tube. Luckily it's made out of paper so it's easy to cut with a knife. As an optional but recommended step, drive some sheet metal screws all around the bucket. This will give the cement something to hold onto it so it stays put. And here you see I also taped a short chunk of steel pipe into the drain hole, which I'll just leave in there permanently. If you don't have any steel pipe, you can use more paper too. Now looking at the lid, you see it has a vent hole in the middle, and then it has these crisscross wires for reinforcement, and those are very important because you do not want the concrete part falling out when you lift the lid. Now we're finally ready for the actual cement work to make the refractory grout. There are several recipes on the internet for castable refractory. The one I used is off BackyardMetalCasting.com and it's made up of one and a half parts Portland cement, two parts silica sand, two parts fire clay, and one and a half parts perlite. Most of this will be sold at the local masonry supply place, but you may need to go to a garden center to get a sack of perlite. I should also mention that this stuff is not just for building foundries. This castable refractory also works for building fireplaces or grouting around stovepipes, or anything else that gets pretty hot and needs to be permanent. Now we're going to start mixing. The Portland cement and the fire clay are pretty fine, so you're going to want to wear a dust mask. And gloves are also a really good idea, especially if you're one of those people who gets a rash from Portland cement. Mixing the ingredients is a lot like baking cookies. You want to take the fine powdery ingredients and mix them together. And then you add the perlite, and then you put in just enough water. The way you know it's just enough water is you should be able to take a little bit and form a ball in your hand, and it should stay ball-shaped even if you roll it around or 
toss it into the air at an inch or two. You want to use clean water for this, or for any concrete. The old rule of thumb is that the water has to be safe to drink, and then it's clean enough to make concrete out of. Once your first batch is mixed up, you can start placing it in the bucket. You'll notice I've taped all the tubes in place, and I've coated them with bearing grease. Another choice would be used motor oil, which is very traditional. The number one thing to be careful of when you're placing this is not to leave any voids. You want to use the toe of your trowel and actually push it into the corners. And it can also be helpful to sort of tap on the side of the bucket so it settles in. You'll probably need to stop a couple times to mix up more cement. You get to the top of the bucket, overfill it a little bit, and then strike it off nice and smooth with your trowel. And then you go and you do the same thing with the lid. Now you give the furnace at least a couple days to cure. If you look at the color here, you can see that it's dry, but it's still pretty green. That's where you want it. That's where you know it's time to strip off the forms. Here, looking down the bore of the furnace, you see it came out pretty smooth. But at this stage, it's still pretty green, and if there's high points, you can knock them off with a paint scraper. And if there's holes, you can just mix up a little more grout and fill them in. And you also don't want to forget to take that tape off your drain hole while you're in here. Okay, now the first major step in the foundry project is done. Now we need to wait a bit though, because we need to give all of this refractory time to cure. Now, there are ways to speed up the curing process by building small fires in it and um, heating it in a controlled way, but the safest and best way is still air drying. So what I'm going to do is just put this aside for a month or two. I have plenty of other Handyman Kevin videos to show you in the meantime. And then when we come back to it, we'll finish the foundry and we'll start pouring some metal and working on our life. See you soon.